So the rather a long title, and um, I mean, basically, this follows on from the, the previous presentation, and it's about you know the, the question of how do you connect everyone and everything everywhere. So you know, we know terrestrial networks have done a great job in, in, in connecting a large proportion of the population, but they certainly don't go anywhere, everywhere. So there we go. <clears throat> this isn't uh, an outline of the talk. So I'll start off a little bit about, you know, there's a, a, a buzz phrase there, the digital divide, just to say a little bit about what that means. Um, and the nature of the devices that are being connected is, is, is changing. It's not just mobile phones nowadays. There's, with the Internet of Things, there's a wide variety of different devices um, which need to be connected. And they're not all in cities. This is one of the issues. A lot of the IoT devices will be distributed in, in fairly remote places. Uh, <coughs> so there's a little bit of background on the, on the convergence of the terrestrial and non-terrestrial networks, um, use cases. And then the role of, we've heard a lot about satellites, and satellites are always in the news, but high altitude um, pseudo satellites or high altitude platforms, um, I think will also have a very important role. And um, we'll, we'll talk a little about the, um, the benefits of using those. <coughs> then spectrum, <coughs> there's a constant battle over spectrum. Um, a lot of conflicting demands, you know, you've got um, very hungry mobile operators wanting spectrum everywhere and as much as they can possibly get. Uh, and then the satellite people um, also trying to protect their spectrum. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about that. <coughs> At the moment, WRC 19, WRC 19 is happening in, uh, uh, in um, Egypt. And there'll be doubtless numerous uh, um, interesting discussions going on there over the next month. <clears throat> then we'll talk a little about the challenges of RF technology, look at the, um, some of the physical issues that we have to face, the status of semiconductor technology and where it, where it currently is to, to address some of these issues. <clears throat> and then I'll give some examples of some real hardware that, um, that, that, that we've built and is um, uh, attracting a lot of attention uh, in, in these applications. <clears throat> so, as has been mentioned this morning, the... Uh, at the moment, only about half of the, uh, of the world's population is connected. Um, the coverage is actually better. So in terms of places that have no coverage whatsoever, it's, it's you know, around about a billion um, out, of the, uh, out of the four billion um, Earth population. <clears throat> and the reason, that there, there may be coverage, but there's a lot of reasons why people don't take it up due to you know, lack of um, local infrastructure, affordability, uh, and you know relevant content. <coughs> 5G is, is coming along, but it's, it's estimated that even by 2025, I think the graph up there is right, it'll be about 34% of the global population of 5G. <coughs> then there's a quotation I've given here from the um, uh, director of um, telecommunic radio communications at uh, the ITU, and he's he's saying there that. Um, there's this overarching ambition for 5G to, to cover everything and everywhere. <clears throat> and he's saying that rural coverage is, is going to be a major problem. And he sees a, 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 a great role coming in for, for mobile platforms, um, HAPs, and satellites. Um, but this will <clears throat> require a convergence of the network, so interconnecting the terrestrial networks with the, with the non-terrestrial networks. So, oh, the other point is, in terms of, of, of coverage around the world, there's a huge variation. So in, in, in the West, in North America and Europe, then, uh, you know, you've got very high levels of, of coverage. But in the more remote areas in, in Africa and uh, Latin America, then, you know, you're really down to, to quite low levels of, of, um, of coverage and usage. <clears throat> so I was saying a little bit about the nature of devices. So it's not all smartphones. Um, the first graph there shows the... Um, the data, uh, the growth in data traffic by device type, and, and sure enough, smartphones are growing pretty rapidly. But it's interesting here, the machine-to-machine -machine communication for IoT is also growing um, in terms of data rates significantly, but in terms of the number of devices, um, then they were estimating that over 50% of mobile devices will be of that form rather than, um, you know, uh, phones and, uh, and, and uh, consumer type things. So we need to provide coverage for all different types of device. <clears throat> so there's a, a picture of what a converged network may look like. So it's um, 
I'm, try, I'm trying to show everything here. So satellites um, and interconnected satellites, very important. Um, high altitude platforms or, or pseudo satellites, which could be in the form of, of um, lighter than air balloons, basically, or um, UAVs, sort of um, fixed wing aircraft. And they each have their own merits. But the idea is that there's a number of different uses. So we could imagine having a, uh, essentially a base station serving directly users on the ground. Um, it could be providing backhaul to remote areas, so local cells, which are then backhauled through um, HAPs or through satellites. <clears throat> and then Internet of Things, again, could be um, served by a base station on, a, on, a, on an airborne platform. So there's a, a wide variety of different use cases that, um, that are relevant. <clears throat> this is um, an output from a recent um, EU document, 5G study, and that's outlining the, the, um, the use cases for what they call enhanced mobile services. So again, multi-connectivity for un underserved areas, um, connecting to um, trains and boats and planes, things that you, you're never going to connect, as has been said, with fibre. And um, it, you know, these, these are all um, uh, you know, attracting more and more interest. So maybe enough of that. <clears throat> so in terms of HAPs, HAPs and satellite synergy, so the, the, we've heard that satellites are going to be transiting across the sky pretty rapidly. You know, you've got satellites that are traveling at seven kilometers a second whizzing above. You have to be able to track those. So you, you know, steerable antennas are, are absolutely essential. <clears throat> the high altitude platform is, is, a, is a different beast. It's got more persistence. It can be stationed reasonably statically over a certain area. Okay, it, it is moving slowly, um, but it's a, it's a much easier um, proposition to connect to a high altitude platform. They would be operating at about 20 kilometers in the stratosphere. Um, so again, the, in terms of the, uh, the path loss and the system gain that's required, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot easier. So um, I think they can be seen as an extension to, rest, to terrestrial networks um, and can also be, deployed very quickly. The good thing about the HAP is, you know, the investment in terms of launching the thing is, is you know, minute compared to putting satellites up. You don't need rockets. You basically need a, a, a canister of, uh, of helium and, uh, and a nice shady wind-free place to launch it from. <clears throat> so they're easier to launch. Once they're up there, they're probably only going to be in operation for maybe three or four months. Um, so the, the lifetime of the equipment is, is less stringent. And they can be, be changed. You know, the thing's not going to be up in, up in the sky for, for years. So if you need to upgrade the equipment or if there are um, issues with um, having to change the configuration, that can be managed. <clears throat> so I think they have an important role to play. Um, and we've seen a lot of, lot of improvements in the technology that, that makes it possible. <clears throat> so this is a slide that I stole from, from ESA, and that's showing the two types. So we've got balloons, and you know, there's a large well-known company that's already deploying a balloon-based network, and um, that is providing service um, in, in countries in South America and Africa. Um, a bit further out, there are the fixed-wing aircraft. And you know, again, we've seen examples of these operating over quite significant um, times now. The difference between the two is that the payload, the, the payload on the balloon is quite significant. You know, they, they've, they've got a pretty good lifting capacity and they can accommodate a large number of solar cells to power it. <coughs> the fixed wing aircraft um, is more challenging. So the, play, the payloads are, are, are smaller and um, obviously where they can operate in terms of, of, of latitude and so on is, is probably more restricted. But they are developing and, and they will have roles as well. Okay, so moving on. <clears throat> so spectrum, there's this huge debate going on. So we've got two or three different factions all battling out um, to try and reserve their chunks of spectrum. <clears throat> and these are a few quotes just leading up to the um, WRC conference um, that's going on at the moment. So we've got the mobile operators insisting that they want to take um, virtually every chunk of spectrum that's available. You've got a lot of concern amongst the satellite operators in that the, you know, they've been identifying millimetre wave bands um, to ensure that 
the, um, the, the capacity of the satellite networks can, can uh, keep pace with what's required. And, and those bands are also now overlapping with a lot of the mobile bands. Then throw HAPS into the mixture, that, that upsets both camps because um, the satellite people want to protect their bands. Again, they, they overlap. And um, the frequencies also overlap with some of the backhaul frequencies that, we, uh, that are used for mobile networks. <clears throat> so these are some of the bands that are being discussed at the moment. So we've got um, mobile here, and then we've got um, HAPS and fixed satellite service. And then there's also inter-satellite links as well, which are perhaps less, uh, less of an issue. So there's new bands being identified. Um, if, we, if we look at HAPS, at the moment, there are some very narrow bands identified. Um, around, about 40, around about 48 is, is, a, is a current band. There's a move to extend or to open up a much wider band around about 39 gigahertz. And then in North America, there's another band down at 26 or 27 gigahertz. Um, I'm going to mention E-band here because I have a vested interest in E-band. It's not as <coughs> strictly allocated for high altitude platform use. There are bands for fixed service satellite in, in E-band uh, and, and higher, in fact. Um, <coughs> But the fact of the matter is this band is being used. There are experimental licenses, and there's quite a bit of work going on <coughs> using, using EVAN. I'll explain a bit why there's, there's some interest in that. Um, and then high throughput satellites, again, they're trying to extend bands. So we've heard that what they term V-band, which is really the lower end of V-band, around about 50 gigahertz. There's a, 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 a desire to, to add a, another couple of gigahertz onto that so that you'd have two quite large usable bands for high throughput satellites. Uh, and then on the mobile, they, again, there's this sort of grab for anything that's, that's available. E-band here is used mostly for backhaul, although there are people thinking that they maybe could use that for access as well. I'm not too sure about that. There's also the, the V-band, the unlicensed band, which has now been extended up to 71 gigahertz. Um, but again, there's some debate as to whether that should be kept as a completely licensed free band or whether that could be allocated for mobile access. So again, there's, there's a lot of discussion over that. So let's just look at some of the um, applications and what's, what's involved. So if we break it down into feeder links and into satellite or into HAPS links, <clears throat> for the feeder link, I mean, we've got a platform that's at 20 kilometers in altitude. And the typical area that would cover would be around about 70 to 80 kilometers in, in diameter. So we're talking about elevation angles of about 30 degrees. Now, the bandwidth that's available um, that's already been allocated are these ones in blue. So 6 gigahertz, 28 and 47. And they're reasonably small bands. You know, there's, there's a not a huge amount of spectrum available there. Uh, the 38 gig band will, will be significantly wider. You know, there's over a gigahertz of bandwidth there. Um, but it all pales into insignificance compared to the amount of, of, of bandwidth that could be, could be used in E-band. <clears throat> now, one of the big challenges, of course, is um, for all of the frequencies above 40 gigahertz is rain attenuation. So th this is the typical um, type of attenuation that you get per kilometer versus frequency. <clears throat> so for most of North America and Europe, we're talking about 42 millimeters per hour. This is the sort of a, the worst case that you'd get for 99.99% availability. <clears throat> so the, these attenuation levels do present a huge challenge uh, to millimeter wave. But the thing to consider is that the availability that's demanded for this type of application could be a lot less than the 99.99 the or 99.99% that you might want for mobile phone network. We're serving areas that have got nothing. So you know, getting 99.9% .9 could be seen as to be quite, uh, quite acceptable. <coughs> so. This one's a bit busy, but I thought I'd just compare. If we look at the bandwidth that's available for the various HAPS bands, so 31, 39, 48, et cetera, <coughs> and compare the sort of data rate that could be achieved, um, because of the limited bandwidth, even if we operate at um, a fairly high modulation level, uh, to 256 QAM, then you're, you're limited by the bandwidth there to around about um, 
one and a half um, um, gigabits per second. <coughs> if we operate E-band um, over two gigahertz channels with 256 quant modulation, then we've got a 10 gigabit per second um, capability. But of course, you have to allow for, for um, fade margin for these things. And th these are fairly, fairly moderate. And I've just done a calculation there based on a, on a typical um, rain height and slant angle. Um, so you can see that <coughs> the fade margin is, is, is reasonably um, sort of useful for a, a, a moderate availability. <coughs> and then I've also, it's interesting for us as to what sort of power we need to deliver in our, in our transmitters. So the power levels I've, I've used here are, again, very achievable, 26 dBm at E-band, um, going to maybe 35 dBm down at 31 gigahertz. Um, the interesting thing I've found really is if, if you compare the data rate, we could drop the data rate down on the E-band to um, um, QPSK, for example, and we could still get um, a, a quite a useful data rate, um, two and a half gigabits per second even, um, on a two gigahertz channel, um, compared to, again, it's still competing with the, uh, with the 48 gigahertz band. And then in terms of rain attenuation, e even at um, uh, 256 QAM um, on the uh, rain path length there at 48 gigahertz is around about two kilometers. <clears throat> if we drop the, the um, E-band down to QPSK, then we get a 19 dB improvement in carry to noise ratio. And therefore you get a similar sort of margin um, and similar data rate. Uh, so that, I thought that was quite interesting. <clears throat> right, the other, the other thing is, uh, we'll see a bit later on, links between platforms is very important. And um, the propagation situation is much more healthy here. You, you're above all of the, uh, the rain and the cloud. And so um, you could support links of hundreds of kilometers. Um, even if we just look at the limitation, obviously the, the, the distance is going to be dependent on the, uh, on the ceiling of the clouds and, and the rain height. So if we look at what would be cloud limited at 20 kilometers, um, you've still got a link that could be nearly 600 kilometers long. Um, if it's rain, if you want to keep away from the rain, rain, it could be 800 kilometers. So these are substantial links, which gives some flexibility in the, uh, in the, in the way the networks are de um, uh, designed. <clears throat> Again, apologies for the, the number of um, figures on here. Uh, this is looking at the system gain that would be required for an inter, inter haps link. Um, you still have to consider some atmospheric loss, um, you, but at, at altitude, it's, it's substantially less than it would be at sea level. So these, these are the curves you will typically see for um, at atmospheric attenuation versus frequency. It only usually goes up to about um, just under 10, well, nine kilometers in height, which, which gives the attenuation. There's, within the ITU, the, they look specifically at the 60 gigahertz band because, of course, that suffers um, severely, even at high altitude, from atmospheric attenuation. But you can see at 48 and um, uh, 70 gigahertz, then atmospheric attenuation becomes um, pretty negligible. So it looks, again, I've plotted the, the power that would be required from the transceiver. Um, versus um, two typical situations here. So 45 um, dBm RX sensitivity would correspond to a 256 quam link. Uh, 56 would be more like 16 quam. And then assuming two foot antennas, you can still um, meet the sort of 200 to 600 kilometer links with a perfectly realizable level of, uh, of RF power. <clears throat> and in fact, as the frequency goes up, if you keep the antenna size the same, then you, you do get a, a benefit from the extra gain from the antennas. Um, and in fact, it's doubled because you get that benefit in both the transmit and the receive. So if we compare that now to the low Earth orbit satellite situation, so here the <coughs> LEOs, or what they call VLEOs, which is one of the um, orbits that um, SpaceX is talking about, they're operating at between 350 and 1100 kilometers. Uh, again, using uh, some of the examples that I've seen in publications, they're looking at elevation angles around about 35 degrees. So that gives you a path length of about 600 to seven, um, 1700 kilometers. 
Um, so that obviously is a lot more challenging. So if we look at the free space loss here, um, I won't even talk about rain attenuation on these ones just at the moment, but the free space loss compared to the HAPS is, uh, you know, tens of dBs different just, in, just because of the distance. Um, I've also shown here the, the, the bands that have, that have been available. So we mentioned the, what's termed V-band here, 52, 52 um, gigahertz is, a, is a, uh, an extension that's also been talked about. Uh, uplinks at 47 to 50 gigahertz and downlinks at 37 to 42 uh, gigahertz. <clears throat> so in terms of free space loss, then obviously as the frequency goes up, it, it, it does become more challenging. So the next one here shows the system gain that would be required for a, uh, a link from a ground to a low Earth orbit satellite. And again, interested to know what sort of power that we'd have to generate to make these feasible. So I've looked here at um, the path lengths, 600 to 1700 kilometers. Um, <clears throat> and with no rain, then again, perfectly realizable sort of power levels of the, of the order of uh, you know, certainly less than 40 dBm would, would suffice. And with antenna gains, round about 58 dB, which, um, you know, round about one meter at, um, at, the, at the higher frequencies. Now, if we put rain into the equation, then we all of a sudden get a system gain that is up, you know, 240 to 250 dB, which is obviously going to be quite a challenge. Um, So the way that this is being addressed is really considering the geographic distribution of the, of the, of the ground links. <clears throat> so they could be thousands of kilometers apart. <clears throat> so really, if we've got a network on the ground of ground feeder links, the likelihood of having a complete blockage in a particular area and, and, and or, or in many areas is quite remote. <clears throat> So we're seeing some pretty clever software-defined network technology now being applied to um, non-terrestrial networks. <clears throat> so that you could network the satellites or the HAPs or, or both together. And with what they call, the, I should think machine learning is the term that's been used and um, software-defined networks, <laughs> <clears throat> then this is really the way to overcome that. So just trying to battle your way through atmospheric attenuation and rain um, is probably not going to be practical, and, and, there is, and the resolution will come by clever network technology. Right, uh, just a bit about technology in terms of semiconductors. Um, it would be nice to think that we could use gallium nitride, but really um, at frequencies above about 40 gigahertz, it's um, quite rare to find um, commercially available GAN. Certainly up at E-band, it, it, it just hasn't happened yet. <coughs> so we're really in, in both KA and V-band, um, GAN is okay at the lower end of that. When you get to V-band and E-band, then we really are um, um, relying heavily on, on, on gallium arsenide technology. One way around this, you might think, is, is phased array antennas. You obviously get um, <coughs> considerable antenna gain, so you can get much higher ER, um, ERP from a phased array antenna. Um, so this plot here shows number of radiating elements versus ERP, and it goes as 20 log of the number of elements, so that you, you get a traumatic advantage there. <clears throat> the issue, of course, is in terms of element spacing. So when we get to the higher frequencies, we're talking about half wavelengths, which are going to be quite challenging to realize in any, in any practical form. Um, again, looking at where you can get to with the different technologies, so with GAN, say you can have 30 dBm as a radiating element, with CMOS, you might be down to zero dBm. Um, so to get the sort of 60 dB um, MIR, EIRP that you'd need, you'd, you're talking about thousands of elements, <coughs> which is possible with silicon technology. But um, the other thing is in terms of power consumption. <coughs> so this again is fairly well um, used slide here, but it shows the trade-off between the number of radiating elements and the power consumption. Um, so there's a sweet spot really, um, power consumption decreases simply on the, on the transmit side as the number of elements increases. But bear in mind that each of those elements has a receiver behind it, and therefore that's a fixed amount of power. <clears throat> and so when you do the sums, 
as you increase the number of elements, the power consumption increases. So it's, it, you know, GAN and Gallimard Snide seems to be the technology that would give the optimum efficiency versus the number of elements. But then again, the trade-off is in terms of element spacing. So I think some, from what we've heard this morning about different um, means of doing steerable antennas, um, then that's one of the challenges that maybe can be addressed from that. <clears throat> right, so I just thought I'd show some practical hardware. Um, this is a typical payload that you would expect for a, a, a satellite or a, um, a high altitude platform <clears throat> where you would have uh, transceivers dealing with the inter-platform links um, and also a transceiver dealing with the ground link. So each payload would essentially have three, three transceivers um, plus uh, a base station, an E node B or a G node B, depending on whether it's LTE or 5G. Um, again, steerable antennas are, are, are essential. <coughs> For high altitude platforms, then the gimbal mounted parabolic antennas are actually um, widely used and because you know, they don't have to scan quickly and you've got the uh, ability to carry the payload on a balloon, then they are quite widely used. <clears throat> so just looking at inside each of these transceivers, in its, in its basic form, this is um, what we have in, in our uh, Morpheus unit. And these are used in, in mobile uh, backhaul. Um, this is an E-band example. And um, inside there, we've got a, a direct conversion um, up converter for the transmitter, a uh, power amplifier with power detector, uh, a direct conversion down converter receiver, and then the, the local oscillators uh, and filtering to, uh, to provide the, <coughs> the, the carriers. <coughs> we also need a diplexer. Most in these type of systems, they're usually um, FDD, so we have separate transmit and receive frequencies. So this is, this is our Morpheus unit. So this is completely integrated. All of these functions are contained essentially under this box. The rest of it is power supply conditioning and, and um, control. And then the, the diplexer is actually integrated into the base of the, uh, of, of the transceiver. <coughs> if we need more power, there's an example here of, of, of um, perhaps a slightly brute force way of doing it, but using power combining. <coughs> now the beauty of working at millimeter wave is that you can do very efficient power combining in waveguide and it is a manageable size and weight. Um, so this is an example of a, of a four-way power combiner. Are we running out of time? All right. We'll move on. So there's lots of results. You can see those in the slides, but we've demonstrated two to three watts power um, combining in uh, in uh, these amplifiers. <clears throat> the interesting thing here is the, the power combining efficiency, which somewhat surprised us, is that um, in a single amplifier, we're getting about 20, 24 or 25 dBm. But this would imply that there was virtually no, no combining loss. So I think this is probably really down to the mimic variation and the, and the difference in matching. But the power combining is surprisingly efficient. I'm going <clears> to <throat> skip through the results and let's look at some uh, some more chunky things here. This, this is a, our transceiver combined with a power amplifier. So the, these are used in, in long range links. It can cover many tens of kilometers. And then I'll move on. Uh, this is um, what we did in an inter-hap link. In this case, you have to be able to switch the, um, the, the duplex spacing. So you don't just have a fixed duplex at one end and the opposite of the other. Each end has to be able to swap its, uh, its duplex arrangement. So it becomes a little bit more complicated. <coughs> uh, and then if we want very high data rate, this is an example of a four channel um, system here, which has got four transmit um, blocks in it, four receive blocks. They're combined through a multiplexer and then fed to an OMT uh, and a polarizer. <clears throat> so here we can actually achieve 40 gigabits per second. And, and this, is, this, is, this is real. We, we have developed this and, and it's been trialed in, the, in, in real applications. Uh, this shows how we get the channels combined. So from the multiplexer, we have transmit and receive on, on left and right hand polarization. Um, at the, at the receiver. It's fed through horizontal and vertical polarization from the OMT. Uh, this is the channel plan. So the diplexer is quite, or the multiplexer is quite demanding. We've got four separated channels here 
uh, each two gigahertz wide. Um, there's some numbers there, we can come back to that. <coughs> Just to show that it's real, there's, there's, there's a photograph of an actual four channel uh, E-band uh, transceiver. Each channel is transmitting about two to three watts and that's operated um, with 40 gigabits per second links over um, in, in the trials up to maybe 20 kilometers at the moment. But um, that's where we are, and I think. To summarize, summarize then, it's, it's clear there is a role for um, non-terrestrial networks and they, they will be blended with terrestrial networks um, to address some of the demands that are, that are expected from 5G. Okay, thank you.